Welcome everyone and good evening and thanks for stepping in and grabbing your Zoom and right at dinner time and sitting down with us so we can talk about friend or foe. A title that I came up with uh, either cleverly or not, but it's a little bit ambiguous so maybe I should go into a little more detail so you know what I'm going to be talking about. Oops. Our gardens, all of our gardens, big or small, complicated or simple, are unique ecosystems. And uh, they exist uh, in a delicate balance between the plants and the various animals that populate it. Some of those organisms, plant or animal alike, um, could be labeled as friends. We like to have them. They're, they're good guys for us. Some others we might look at as foes or enemies or pests. I think labeling a biological entity as a foe could be problematic because it may necessitate an intervention, which could be benign or it could be toxic. And I think my plea tonight is rather than jumping into an intervention or elimination scenario right away, I think maybe we should consider trying to understand the situation more carefully. So what I, well, you know, it did it again, sorry. Um, the, uh, this Zoom sometimes skips slides, so I apologize if that happens, and it happened on the very first one. Anyway, what I wanna do tonight is provide or offer a different perspective of some of the organisms that live in our garden landscapes. I can't get to all of them, I'm just going to get to some, but I'm hoping you get the point, it'll open your eyes to maybe look at things a little differently in your garden. I have three objectives that um, I'm gonna use in this um, talk tonight. The first one is I wanna provide some new insights, some new information, some new facts into the benefits and threats of some of the garden, uh, garden uh, organisms that are common to all our, uh, our yards and gardens. Some of these new factoids might make you smile. Some of them may, might make you grimace, but I'm hoping they'll open your eyes to maybe seeing things a little differently. I wanna introduce some thought provoking ideas regarding the activities of the garden creatures around us. Just step back and think about them a little different. I think it's a good exercise and it help us help us all make better decisions when it comes to managing the pests or our ecosystems in general. Lastly, I wanna provide enough information so you can make a knowledgeable decision about how or what to do if you need to do anything at all. A lot of people come to the Ask a Master Gardener tables and they'll say, I have a red and black bug on my roses, how do I kill it? There's something in the mulch, some black beetles. How do I, what kind of pesticide do you use to get rid of them? Maybe we don't need to eliminate them. Maybe we do, but maybe we don't. Maybe we need to understand them more. That's what I want to do tonight. And so kind of in a summary of what, I, what I'm planning to, my premise is that a garden's ecosystem is or can be very complicated. We need to understand that to better maintain and sustain it. I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of that and hope that you'll take it up further as you study your garden. Uh, it skipped a slide on me, I'm sorry. Some people, when they wanna engage uh, an audience, whether live or in, uh, uh, in Zoom, they will use flamboyant outfits. I, I mine is kind of pedestrian. They might uh, use uh, exaggerated body movements, I'm too awkward, or some people rely on jokes. My jokes are not appropriate for anybody over six years old, I've been told. <laughs> so then other people like myself rely on quotes or observations of people who are smarter than me, more observant than me, or more insightful than me. That's what I'm gonna do tonight. I have a few quotes that'll guide us through this. Uh, trip. And the first one's from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is a American poet, uh, essayist, and a philosopher, writer. 
he was in the 1800s. He said, people only see what they are prepared to see. So my question to you is, what do you see when you look at your own garden? What are you prepared to see? Do you see this? This is the end of the season right now, but maybe you view your garden as a, as a horn of plenty where you can get lots of wonderful tomatoes and peppers and basil and eggplant for your table, for your neighbor's table, for your children's table, for the food bank. Maybe you view your garden all in this perspective, or maybe you are quite aware of the drought that we were in, we are in, and we're going to continue in, unfortunately. So you have put in drought resistant plants, whether natives or succulents like these, but you want still to have some beauty. So you put in some of the aloes or the echeverias. Maybe you see your garden like that, or maybe like this. Maybe you just want to see your garden, you expect to see your garden as this kaleidoscope of color, of texture, of size, of shape, of annuals or perennials or flowering shrubs or flowering trees. Now, all these gardens that I have pictured here have something we're in short supply of, of course, and that would be water. But nonetheless, I'll bet those of you who view your garden like this, even with the water restrictions and the hot summer, you have beautiful flowers that you could enjoy. Maybe you look at your garden like that. Or maybe you're a science geek like me and you view your garden like this from all the perspective of all the various critters that come into it. But maybe, ah, maybe we should be looking at it with all of those features. It's a complex ecosystem and it's a balance amongst all these various factors. We need to look at that and try to reconcile that and help us make a better ecosystem and a better environment for all of us. My second observation is probably the most critical of the entire talk. From an individual who had a major impact during our lifetime, Nelson Mandela, very simple statement, nothing is black or white. And I want to take this statement and go through the material tonight. Let's consider this idea, nothing is black and white with regard to the arthropods. What are arthropods? You remember your Greek, I'm sure. Yeah, arthropod means jointed foot. So jointed legs, heavily jointed legs of the insects, the arachnids, which are the spiders. Let's look at it with other arthropod. Ah, boy, it's skipping, I'm sorry. Other arthropods, the crustaceans. These are just, these are names, some I'll, I'll show you in a minute. These are just class names. Scientists have a, a field of study called taxonomy where they organize and put animals or plants together based on their similarities. They're called classes. There are lots of different criteria. These are classes. I'll show you some of those. We'll also look at the idea with regard to some of the vertebrates. Not many, but a few of the vertebrates that come into our garden. And lastly, even some plants that can be looked at from the perspective of friend or foe. So then how do we determine if it's a friend or a foe? Well, we have something, a uh, mantra that we say as master gardeners in our training. Well, it depends. That's one of those things. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on you, what you think about it. And it may depend upon or may require. Ooh, my, my thing really locked up on me there. It may require tolerance. Can you accept a few wormy apples? Can you accept some aphids on your rows? Just scrape them off and put them in your bouquet, no problem. Can you accept some holes in your basil leaves or in your lettuce leaves? And if so, then maybe those critters are not really foes. Maybe they're just an annoyance. But if you decide, after you learn about the critters, they're good and they're bad elements. If you decide that the organism is a foe, 
there are management options available. And I'm going to share those with you at the end. I give it to you here. This is a, it's a website for the University of California. It's IPM, Integrated Pest Management. It's a wonderful site. I'm going to show you at the end how to use it and what it gives you because you likely will have some sort of critter that I don't talk about tonight. You might want the information and you can get it on this website. So let's get into some individual things that you may or may not have ever thought about. But to give you a different perspective, perhaps, these are called centipedes. You probably know centipedes. They're in a class called Calopida or however you want to say that. That's just another class of arthropods. Insects are a class. Arachnids, spiders are a class. This is just a, a, a designation of a group of critters. Uh, these guys are called hundred leggers in, uh, in jargon. And they're not, they don't have a hundred legs, but they have one leg per well, uh, two legs <laughs> per segment. So you see a segment here, 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 and they have a leg on either side. This is called the house centipede. This is the very common one that you'll see in your garden. This one is, well, it's just a big brown one, and that's all I'll call it. But this is the house centipede. A gentleman came up to me at a farmer's market one day, and he said, I have all these centipedes in my garden. How do I kill them? Well, you know, I didn't know anything other than say, well, you could step on them. I hadn't thought about it. And afterwards, when I went home and I thought about that, I go, you know, I didn't give that gentleman enough information for him to make a decision. Did he need to stop on him or not? Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but I didn't give him the information. Oh my, I'm sorry. This is uh, really doing some things for me. So is he a friend or a foe? Well, you know, they have creepy factors. That is, they have lots of legs and they're fast and scary. Lots of people are just, very uncomfortable with things with lots of legs that move fast. Large specimens can bite, but we don't have any large specimens. You want a large specimen? Go to Texas. I'll pass on that. So these guys mainly, they're creepy and fast. But did you know, they prefer damp, dark places. And what they do, I didn't know this, they capture flies, cockroaches, and other pests, and they eat them. And here's the critical thing, they never damage plants. Had I known this at the time, I could have given the gentleman that information. That might have changed his perception of this critter and what he had to do about it. The millipede is in another class. I always like this description. Well, it's similar but different than the, the centipede. This guy's called the thousand leggers. He has four legs per segment. They're bigger than the centipede, at least bigger than the house centipede that we have around here. The millipede also has a creepy factor associated with it. It might even have a creepier factor because there's twice as many legs. If you've ever seen one running, they kind of run, it's pretty amazing to see. And if you are creeped out by lots of legs, this is the gold standard. According to the IPM guidelines in large numbers, they may damage sprouting plants or seeds. Large numbers, is that five or 50? I've never seen hordes of these things running across my garden bed, but they may damage a, a, a sprouting seed. But you know what? They prefer not to. They prefer damp and dark places just like the, uh, the centipede does. And here's the thing, they break down dead stuff. They eat dead stuff. I'm gonna come back to that over the next two or three critters. This is really critical to good soil and plant health. These guys break down dead stuff. They curl up with threatened like you see over on the left and they do not bite. So other than being kind of creepy and an annoyance, what's the problems? They do good things for us. Pill bugs and sow bugs. You probably know them. These are crustaceans. They are related to crabs and lobsters more than they are insects. Here's something that I'm sure you're dying to know. Rather than lungs, these guys have gills and they live terrestrially. That's neat. Okay, this guy on the left is a roly-poly. 
the doodle bug, the common pill woodlouse. These are the guys that, that curl up into a little ball when you touch them. When I was a boy, me and my friends used to catch these guys. They'd roll up in little balls and we had a slander driveway and we'd poke them with our fingers like you do marbles to watch them roll down into the street. Nah, fun in the 50s, I guess. The bigger one on the right is called the woodlouse. They kind of the same. They have these armor plates, if you will. This is an exoskeleton. The skeleton's on the outside of their body. But they're a little bit uh, different than the roly-poly, and they're uh, bigger, certainly. So are they friends or are they foes? Well, many of you are probably gardeners, and probably a lot of you have compost piles. And if you have comp compost piles, you have lots of them. If you have leaves and uh, leaves that are damp under your plants and you turn them over, you have lots of them. Some people don't like something that there's lots of them. They occasionally feed on seedlings and they do like leaves and fruits and vegetables that touch the ground. Think strawberry. They love those things. So while they can be a bit of a pest on your seedlings and your strawberries, they feed primarily on decaying material. They like dead stuff, like this, the millipede. They're important decomposers for the soil microbes. I have to give you a little bit of soil talk here. Maybe some of you were in the webinar that myself and Mike Corby, my colleague, did, uh, I think, early in the year, in January, maybe. We talked about the soil, and I talked about the universe beneath our feet, which is the soil microbes. There are billions, with a B, of bacteria and fungi and protozoans down underneath the surface of the, of the ground. And what are they doing? They're making nutrients available to the plants. Without them, the plants are not going to do well. Where do these new microbes get the stuff that they work on? They get it from the sow bugs, from the pill bugs, from the um, millipedes that eat the dead decay decaying stuff and pass it through their intestinal tract and excrete it out into the soil where the microbes get it and work on it and change it into a form that the plants can use. That's a critical aspect to soil and plant health. Here's one I bet you didn't know. I didn't know it. These little guys can remove heavy metals from soil. They actually eat lead, arsenic, cadmium, and they make, they crystallize it into little spheres into what they call their mid gut, into the middle of their intestinal system. And they just sit there. So the heavy metals are no longer able to leach down into the groundwater. What I can't tell you though, and I wish I could, is what happens when one of them dies? What happens to the little crystallized spheres of heavy metal? Are they now a problem again? Or do they have to be ingested by another pill bug? The fact is these guys are actually used in slag pits and around coal mines where there are heavy metals. This is more anecdotal than science driven, but there's a lot of information on it. It's kind of an interesting factoid that most people don't know. Then we have this guy. This guy is one of the uh, least attractive insects. He's a Jerusalem cricket. In uh, this, this roughly translates into children of the soil. It's also called a potato bug. That's what I learned. And as they got big old mandibles, which are jaws. You see this? And they are really ugly guys. They live underground mainly, and they come out at night. And they have a very significant creepy uh, scare factor. A lot of people really don't like them because they're really, really ugly. And they can do some damage to plant roots. But guess what? They feed primarily on decaying material, recycling nutrients for the microbes. And here's another soil factoid for you. If you think of soil as a mass, about 45% of it is minerals. That's the rock products. About five or 10% is organic material, depending where you are. 25% of it is water and 25% of soil is air. Plants need air, microbes need air, insects need air. So critters like this, 
burrow into the ground and they aerate the soil. They are essentially harmless. And apparently they're food sources for birds. Birds don't, don't mind that they're ugly, I guess. Once again, nothing is black or white. How about this guy? Earwig. They were named earwigs based on old English words, which I can't pronounce, which mean which uh, roughly meant ear wiggler. Uh, the urban myth that they crawl into your ear, into your brain and lay eggs is an urban myth. It doesn't happen. These guys are uh, ferocious looking with their pinchers. I've been pinched by them. It doesn't hurt. Uh, you can distinguish males from females from uh, the size and shape of these things. I, of course, don't know which this one is. These guys can devastate seedlings. If you have a brand new little two inch eggplant, they can cause some damage on that. They like soft fruit, strawberries, any uh, tomatoes that touch the ground. They'll crawl up into the plant as well. And they can bite if trapped in the clothing. I don't know why you have them trapped in the clothing, but nonetheless. But did you know that these guys can actually exert significant biological control? Sometimes. They feed on living organisms that cause us dyspepsia. They, call, they eat mites and aphids. Aphids are the Cheetos of the insect world. Everybody likes to eat them, and the earwig is right in there with them. So while they're probably leaning towards the faux category, they also can do some things that help us along. There are ways to control earwigs with baits and with traps. You can find that on the IPM uh, website, which I'll show you. That brings me to observation number three. We're done with the insects. I was uh, in my academic days, I was a radiation scientist. And um, one of the pioneers in my field was Marie Curie. And she won two Nobel Prizes in the early 1900s. And she said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Which brings me then to this. And I will admit, even though I'm a biologist and I love creatures, there is one creature that I have an irrational bias against, and you're looking at her. I frankly think the Black Widow is the creepiest animal that had ever crawled upon the face of the earth. However, she eats insects. Her webs are easy to identify. That means you're not gonna be surprised by her. They're irregular and very sticky. You see they're very irregular. There's no pattern like some of those beautiful webs you see. And from my perspective, from a, from a, from a friend perspective, they're really easy to squash. Now, some people, some of my colleagues shake their head at that, but if you go to the IPM website and look for management strategies of the Black Widow, stepping on them is one of the management strategies. On the fall factor, they really have a creep factor. And for me, a very, very serious creep factor, but they are venomous. That's the biggest issue. And their venom is, is very powerful. And for sensitive people like uh, children, old people or people with immune compromise uh, systems, this venom can be very dangerous. Now, I have this thing about black widows. You you're obviously know that by now. And it's an odd thing that everybody in Contra Costa County who has a black widow problem comes to my table at the Shadelands Farmer's Market and they share their black widow stories with me. Some of them are just amazing. I could uh, come to the table, I'll share them. I'll, I'll show you the lady who came to the table with a picture on her phone of her fluffy white bedroom slippers, inside of which was one of these. I don't know about anybody else, but I went home and threw out my white fluffy bedroom slippers. But that's the kind of thing that I get at the market sometimes. But you know what? I'll put my personal angst about Black Widows aside and, and talk, hopefully if I can get the slide to go, about spiders in a general sense. Oh, unfortunately, there you go. <laughs> ah, the wonders of Zoom. People come up to the table oftentimes and they'll say, how do I kill the spiders in my bathroom window? 
there's spiders all over such and such a planet. What can I spray on them to kill them? Spiders have an inherent creepy factor, I have to admit. A lot of people don't like them, but I'm putting that aside because of, of this. Worldwide, worldwide, spiders eat 400 to 800 million tons, that's tons, of prey per year. Think of that. 400 to 800 million tons of prey per year. That's more than the combined weight of all the world's adults. This is the kind of information I'd like to pass on to you because I'm always mindful that people have to go to really boring family parties, neighborhood parties where you don't want to be. Trust me, if you go on the next party, if you have one, and so you don't want to be there, just bring this up to people and they'll show you the door. And because I like to, to enlighten you and brighten your life with bats, here's another one. This is an urban myth that each of us swallow on average eight spiders per year in our sleep. That's an urban myth. It's not true. Maybe five. I don't know. Keep that in mind as you go forth. I'm going to talk about some vertebrates now. I'm sure many of you, vertebrates are one of the most frustrating things to deal with. And there are a lot of, there are very tiers of complexity here that we'll at least try to touch on. I'm not going to touch on some of the, some of the animals that I'm sure you're interested in, but we'll talk about that at the end. Here's one. Uh, I, w let me uh, give a caveat. The ones I selected to talk about are ones that there are some friend and foe elements to it. Some of the rodents and some of the other uh, vertebrates, I don't see any friend uh, component really, so I didn't in involve them. Here we have the mole. The mole is blind. It has big clawed feet. It tunnels under the ground. It has wonderful soft fur, if you would ever touch one, I have in years gone by. The mole tunnels around and this is an interesting thing. People usually don't like them because they have tunnels in your lawn, but moles can eat per day half their body weight in grubs. These are grubs. Grubs are the larva or the baby of beetles. June bugs, for instance, uh, lay their eggs and they turn into grubs. What do grubs do? They eat the, uh, the uh, roots of your plants, of your turf, your lawn, or of your garden plants. This guy will eat his, half his weight a day in them and other insects. He also eats some good guys like earthworms. Another thing that the mole is doing which you don't think about too often, he's aerating the soil because he's digging a big old trench in there. So there's some positive elements to our friend, the mole. However, if he's doing the tunneling in your lawn, he's most certainly a foe. Now, this is, this is where he comes out, but you can see his tunnels as kind of a, a bulge in your lawn. You can stomp it down. That may drive him away. It's a, the old cliche that if you make your yard less attractive than the neighbors, they'll go to your neighbors. Don't tell the neighbors you did that though. So this is one of those complexity. This is one of those, you can see the friend and foe elements, and then you have to weigh it out. And you say, if this is going on in the back of your lot, near the fence line, say, or around some trees or some shrubs, you can leave them alone. They're not causing any problems because moles don't eat plants. They eat grubs and insects and worms. Gophers eat plants. So these guys, while they could, if they tunnel close to a seedling, could disrupt it, but they're not going to eat it. So it's, it's, it's a perception and it's your weight. If this is in your lawn, you're going to have to do something about it. You can try to drive them away. All those devices, those ultrasonic things, nah, they don't work. The only way really to deal with them if you're in the lawn is to trap them. And that's an unfortunate reality. Here's another critter. This one is not a handsome animal. In fact, the night before last, I caught one in a live trap. And I will talk about that in a little while in more detail. But you know, 
they eat snails. Nobody really likes snails unless you're in Paris, I guess. They eat insects. And here's one. They eat small mammals, mice and rats. I didn't know that. And they eat roadkill. That's why so many of them become roadkill. They are not bright animals. They have the smallest brain to body ratio of any mammal. So they're not real bright. They go on the road to eat something and they get run over. But if they're in your yard, they're doing this. And this, this is one, they eat ticks. Think Lyme disease. But they are creepy. They're not handsome and they have big teeth and they have lots of them. Here's a little bit of useless information for you. They have more teeth in their mouth than any North American mammal. I think there are 50 of them. And what do they do with those teeth? They eat berries, grapes, fruits, nuts, anything you grow that hits the ground. They can fight with your pets, but they're really not aggressive unless you corner them. And they do carry a variety of disease organisms, ticks, mites, and lice. Here's a balancing act for you. But you know, for possums, you can keep them out. You can exclude them from your basement or from your deck or from your shed. And if they're out in their yard, if they're not causing any problems, they're not actually a big issue. And think about this, maybe you don't have mice and rats. Nothing is black or white except this guy. The striped skunk have serious body odor, really, really serious body odor. And probably the most negative aspect to the skunk is they can harbor rabies, which of course we all know is a lethal disease in other mammals. But did you know that skunks are particularly good at catching rats? And they are particularly good at finding and destroying yellow jacket nests. And like their pal, the raccoon, they let you know when you have lawn grubs. If you don't have lawn grubs, they won't dig up your lawn. Now, I'm not saying you should welcome the family of skunks under your deck to drive you out with their, with their uh, odors. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is, because you can exclude them from those places. All I'm saying, if they're walking across the back of your lot, maybe you don't need to do anything about it. And maybe you don't have any rats. It's all perspective and choices but choices based on knowing the pros and cons of these various critters. Here's one who is not one of my favorites, the raccoon. Some people say they're cute, kind of, when they're little, certainly. And like the skunk, they let you know when you have lawn grubs, so you can treat the lawn grubs. But they have serious teeth. They can be very aggressive. They'll come up and look in your slider, slider if you've ever seen it, don't leave your slider open. They'll go through a cat door. They can cause structural damage. They can climb into your attic. They can get into your garage. They eat your produce. Probably even more dangerous is they carriers of distemper, which is a canine distemper, which is a serious disease in dogs. And they have ectoparasites, fleas and things. Here's one you may or may not be aware of. They're scat their poop, their excrement can harbor roundworms. And it's a very serious roundworm. And some people are becoming more concerned about this because there's more raccoons. And one of my associates who knows more about mammals than I do said that most every raccoon in this area carries these roundworms. It's very rare, very rare. I wanna stress that for people to be infected by this roundworm, but those that have been infected are very disabled or die. It's a very serious roundworm, very resilient, that can hatch and, and it will get into your body and go to where you don't want it to go. So raccoons, since there's lots of them, they can get in your house and they are gonna poop. And these roundworms can be a problem, not only from the odor problem, they're a mess. Raccoons tend to all go at the same place and they call latrines. If you have a latrine at the back of your property, which I did, uh, you have to glove up, mask up, 
uh, do double plastic bags, take two or three inches of soil and get rid of it. So it's, it's potentially very dangerous, but it's rare. I wanna say that, but here's the thing. Other mammals can also get this roundworm like dogs and cats. So we have to be aware of it, be aware of what raccoon scat looks like and be able to dispose of it properly. I caught a raccoon last week. I have a vineyard in my place. My, my yard is completely surrounded by uh, uh, electric fence and other uh, things to keep them out. But of course they have all night to figure out how to get around me. They get in there occasionally. So in the same trap that I caught the possum with, I caught the raccoon the week before. So you're asking yourself, what do you do with them? You know what you do with them? I let them go in my front yard because that's what I have to do legally. You cannot move wildlife if you catch a squirrel, a raccoon, a skunk, a possum. If you catch them in a live trap, you cannot move them off your property. That's the law. Now there are outfits out there that are licensed by the uh, California uh, Fish and Game Commission or whoever they are. And they are licensed to take care of these creatures. They will come and take them away from your property. They'll help you catch them, but it costs money. They will take them away. And uh, since they can't um, move them to another site, they have to euthanize them. So that's another part that we have to weigh in on. So you have to be aware of these things if you're going to catch them. How about birds, friend or foe? Let's your goldfinch. I love them. I have a couple of these finch feeders and sometimes there'll be 12 or 15 of them on them. I love watching them. However, did you know that finches are particularly adept at skeletonizing leaves? Here's a picture I got off the internet. This is a picture I took myself of a sunflower leaf that they had just started with. You see that they skeletonized. That means they leave the veins of the leaf, but they take all the green, good, yummy part. It's very unsightly and eventually the plant doesn't do very well because it can't do its photosynthesis. They like sunflowers, they like zinnias. We have lots of birds in our area. Crown sparrows, finches, robins, crows, all kinds of things, we love them. Visually and auditory appeal. If you ever heard of mockingbirds, wonderful. They consume insect pests. I've heard that they consume slugs, I've never seen it. And some of them are pollinators. That would be the hummingbirds but they disrupt seeds. They dig up uh, and eat small seedlings. They eat fruit and they skeletonize leaves. These are hard to manage. You have to use nets and, and try to exclude them. But these are things they have to, you can you remember I mentioned in the question, uh, an answer period using a uh, floating row cover will allow you to have seeds germinate and get to a size that the uh, birds might not be able to get to. Nothing is black or white. So my penultimate observation that is second to last is what is a weed? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a plant whose virtue has not yet been discovered. You remember this when you were a child? You would blow your breath across these and the seeds would scatter and your parents would go, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. Weeds establish quickly. They have almost 100% germination sometimes. They spread easily sometimes under the ground. They grow in inhospitable places like driveways or brick, brick uh, uh, patios. Removing them, particularly in Contra Costa County with its clay induces back issues and intense frustration, some people like me. But did you know? They protect soil from erosion and clay soils are particularly prone for erosion because of their small particle size. These, many of these um, weeds take up phosphorus, potassium, copper, calcium, iron, magnesium. And when they die, all those nutrients which are needed by the plants we really love are available. They condition soil. In that one week in Contra Costa County when you can actually pull up a weed, if you pull up a, a dandelion, you can get tap roots a foot long. 
So they're aerating the soil. They attract beneficial insects. Some of them you can eat and they provide biodiversity. I can't go into it now, but you want multiple different types of plants in your garden ecosystem. I'm not saying you shouldn't pull weeds. I'm just saying there's more to it than that. And I'm not gonna say anything more because November 16th, we're gonna have a webinar at this very time slot on weeds. My colleagues, I think there's two of them, are going to give a talk on weeds. I'm sure they'll talk about the edible ones and the ones for pollinators and how to manage a very difficult problem. And so, I hope you had a different perspective of some of the creatures that inhabit or visit our garden ecosystems. It's not always easy, but I, I hope you'll start thinking about it from the friend and pro, foe perspective. Get all the information you can get before you make the decision about what you're gonna do. Here are some of the ones that I think are real friends that I wasn't gonna talk about tonight. Here's the ones that I think are real foes that I didn't talk about either. I didn't have time. That doesn't mean they're not of interest to you. I expect you do have questions about these. And here it is. If you go to the IPM website, this is what you will see. Don't worry about reading off all the stuff that's here. I just want you to look at these four panels. And the only panel really you're interested in is this one. You may, be in, you may be interested in the others, but this is the big guy. So you click on this and you get this. Now there's a lot on here. And there, I really encourage you to go and look at some of this stuff. But what I'm gonna highlight is this part right here. It's called Quick Links. This is kind of what we call the Pest Note Library and the Quick Tips Library. You can go to one of these and find out anything you wanted to find out about your pest. Another way you can do it is up here in the very top, it says enter search terms. You could put gopher or rat or deer or something in there, and you would get a list of UC websites about that. But if you want to go to here, the pest notes are usually four, five, six pages long, much more detailed about the pest, its biology, how to manage it. The quick tips is uh, they're shorter. Let's say you clip, uh, you click on that, and there they are. This is the Quick Tips Library, and in alphabetical order, you have all the various creatures that could uh, be a problem for you. There are ants, there are aphids, even bed bugs, earwigs, deer, ground squirrel, gophers, everything. And if you click on one of these, like ants, you see this. This is a pest. This is a quick tip. It's a. This is what we hand out at the markets. This is one side of the handout. This is the other side. Gives you a little bit of the biology and how to manage it. This gives you enough information that you can now go and make the decision that's best for you. But it's not just your bias like me with my spiders. You actually get the pluses and minuses and you make the decision. So my last observation is if you truly love nature, you will find beauty everywhere. Vincent van Gogh, yes, you certainly will. Nope, I won't fall for that. I thank you for your attention. I hope you got something out of this that you can use. And lastly, yeah, some things really are black and white.